Okay, so I'm going to go over Chapter 3, Racial and Ethnic Inequality, um, because we didn't get to go over this in class. Okay, so um, when we're looking at employment, we can see how racial and ethnic inequality operates in the present day. So we like to think that everyone in the U.S. has the same chance to succeed, but when it comes to jobs, the playing field is far from even. So, you know, in your book, they talk about this as some examples from your book, the odds of being a financial analyst, um, you know, of, as far as in 2012, white people were more than three times, or sorry, more than twice as likely to be a financial analyst than Hispanic Americans, and three times as likely as African Americans to be financial analysts. So why does that matter? What does that even mean? Well, a financial analyst, analyst is a very wealthy profession, right? You need... Um, a level of education, you need, you know, um, some sort of degree, right? It pays a lot of money. It, it gives a secure lifestyle. So it kind of matters when you start looking at the fact that some people are more likely to be in these positions and that it's based on just what race they were born into or what ethnic group. So, you know, on the other side here, you have the odds of being a custodian or housekeeper, um, also in 2012. So Hispanic people are three times more likely than white people to have these jobs. And African Americans are twice as likely than white people. So again, why is this important? What does it matter what job? Well, these jobs are low paid. They're low status. They're not valued in the society, right? They don't give you a good standard of living. Um, they often don't require a high level of education or a degree. So, you know, it kind of comes down to the idea of does race and ethnicity still matter in U.S. society? Well, when it comes to um, looking at employment, clearly it does. So race itself is a socially constructed category of people who share biologically transmitted traits that members of society define as important, right? So, you know, sociologists view racial categories at best as misleading and at worst as harmful, right? And the reason this is is because of the way that it defines us. It gives people justifications for saying you're this or you're that and really kind of giving people different spots on a hierarchy, like we were talking about those social locations in class, that, you know, when you start to say people are different, unless you have a multicultural view where you say, well, people are different, but their differences should be celebrated, then you tend to essentialize or prioritize one group over the other as the right one, the normal one, the natural one, the one that all other groups are compared to. And in our white supremacist society, that's white people, right? They are the standard by which all are just assumed or judged against. So obviously how we define it is very important, right? When we're talking about a group of people that share biologically transmitted traits, that's also misleading. Because, you know, like it says here on the slide, there's more genetic diversity within racial categories than between them. Meaning that there's more genetic variation within the group white people than there is between the group, you know, white people and African Americans. So, you know, like, for example, when you give blood, it's not as if you give blood just to your ethnic racial group, right? You just have a blood type. And so, um, you know, when it comes down to these biological things, the melatonin in our skin is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, we assign value to it, right? And meanings to it. And that's what sociologists are really looking at is what are these meanings? How do we understand them? How does it divide humanity? So, you know, um, right now, again, these stats are a couple years old, but whatever. Um, there's 9.1 million people in the U.S. that identify themselves as multiracial. Um, 8.2% of all marriages are between people of different racial categories. And we'll talk about this in a bit, how this obviously is quite an uptick from the past, but that's because it was only about 40 years ago that that was illegal. Um, and the number of multiracial births has tripled in the past 20 years. So the fact that um, there's more multiracial births, again, multiracial um, or interracial marriages, Again, uh, well, I mean, it's not as if all places banned interracial marriage until 40 years ago. It's just the last laws on the books went into the early 1970s um, when it comes to misog uh, miscegenation laws. So it's interesting that when the trends change, right, when there's more people that are multiracial, more people getting married to people of different racial categories, you start to see how the trend starts to change the way we see each other. And we'll talk about this in a minute with ethnicity, but you know, 
when we look at people, we try to say like, well, what are you? And if you're multiracial, this can be a very frustrating situation because you're like, well, I'm this and I'm that, right? Like I have a friend that um, people tend to do that to him because you can't quite, you know, put a label or put him in a box. And that's what we like to do, right? When we categorize people, we like to put them in a box so that we can kind of have a stereotype or assumptions about who they are based on that racial category. So I have a friend that is um, half Russian, half Japanese. So people are very like, what are you? Right? <laughs> they have a hard time trying to understand that, you know, well, he's multiracial. So, you know, when we start to see more and more people within these categories, um, this really starts to change the way that we see each other and the way we try to label each other. So ethnicity is a bit different from race. Um, ethnicity is a shared cultural heritage, which typically involves common ancestors, language, and religion. So, you know, for example, when people say like, oh, people that are Hispanic, it's like, well, what does that even mean? It just means people that come from, you know, countries of origin that use the language of basically colonial Spain or were at some point colonized by Spain, right? So they speak Spanish, basically, is what I'm trying to say. Long story short, countries that speak Spanish. So, you know, that's pretty vague, and that's kind of an umbrella that, of course, just puts all sorts of different groups of people together that don't have necessarily the same foods, cultures, backgrounds, understandings, but there are various, you know, they, they tend to have the same language or religion, so then that becomes kind of the ethnic heritage. Right. So, um, you know, in your book, I think they talk about how race and ethnicity are different, but some of them go together, like how Korean Americans or Native Americans can share physical traits and ethnic traits. So, you know, there's obviously going to be some interesting kind of cultural overlaps, especially when we get into those kind of boundary areas of what is ethnicity. We'll talk about it as we go on. But this idea of pan ethnicity, where they basically say there's like four groups of people and you fit in one of them, right? So like even if you take the the pan-ethnic group white people, which is really a colonial invention of America, you know, if you see that, that's not really how it works in other countries. It's really interesting. So, um, you know, there was a shift within American history where people stopped kind of talking about, oh, I'm, you know, my ancestors are from, you know, again, if we're talking about white people as a group, uh, ancestors from Germany or, you know, um, England or wherever, right? Like just kind of, you know, European or, you know, Asiatic countries or whatever. Um, you know, that kind of went from being, oh, I'm Irish, I'm Italian too, I'm being white, right? <laughs> Which is a very amalgamous category of people that has changed dramatically over the last 150 years of how we even define whiteness. So it's a really interesting thing. And I have a video I'll show you about that too. Anyway, that kind of gets into how you know, our perceptions of this, um, these pan-ethnic categories are that we apply all these kind of stereotypes to them. So anyone that's considered white gets what's called white privilege, this kind of assumption that they're not criminal, that they're good people, that they're law-abiding, that they can be trusted, that they're knowledgeable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Kind of like the opposite treatment that people get if they're in a, you know, a minority group that's kind of more demonized or considered deviant. So I don't know. It's interesting when it comes to ethnicity, you know, we have a pan-ethnic category that's supposed to encapsulate everyone. Like again, like saying Latinos or saying Asians, right? Like if you look at the pan-ethnic category, Asian, how many different cultures are you squishing into one box, right? If you're saying Asian, you're saying, okay, well, does that encapsulate people that are Pacific Islander? Does that encapsulate people that are Chinese, that are Japanese, that are, you know, South Asian. How then do you just amalgamate all the differences between those specific cultures and between their different languages, their different cultures, their different histories that have their own context, right? There's similarities, but of course, you know, by creating these pan-ethnic categories, we give ourselves an easy view of the world. There's four types of people, right? And that leads to a lot of stereotyping and misunderstanding about groups of each other instead of just acknowledging that even within these pan-ethnic categories, there's a ton of breakdown. So this is kind of what I was talking about with that breakdown. So if you look at the racial or ethnic, you know, classification, you see that there's all sorts of subcategories 
under each one. So again, going back to the Asian thing, Chinese, Asian, Indian, Filipino, Vietnamese, Korean, Japanese, Cambodian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's always this like other category as well, people that aren't defined through these kind of uh, statistics. So it just shows you that putting these pan-ethnic categories minimizes the differences, the important differences between a lot of these cultures by just squishing them all together and saying, well, all people that are from there do this, all people that are this do that. Um, and it's really a overly simplistic, um, uneducated way to look at the, how the world actually works. But it is a way that we group each other, and um, especially statistically, to try and understand trends in the population. <clears throat> so, of course, a lot of this comes from immigration. So, of course, you know, um, w this country has a long history of immigration. And, um, you know, we wouldn't really be the country that we are today, and the capitalist state that we are today, without immigrant labor. So the, the racial and ethnic um, diversity in the United States is a product of immigration, having people come from everywhere. Um, the Great Immigration extended from the end of the Civil War till the outbreak of World War I. So I'm going to show you a clip about that really quick. Um, just like sets up some of the historical context because it's really important to, you know, when we're talking about um, these kind of larger sociological issues of how we understand race and ethnicity. We need to be cognizant of the history so we can understand how people in the past and what they did, their beliefs, their, their actions have shaped the kind of situations that we're in today. So let me show you that right now. Hi, I'm John Green. This is Crash Course U.S. History, and today we're going to continue our extensive look at American capitalism. Mr. Green, Mr. Green, I'm sorry, are you saying that I grow up to be a tool of the bourgeoisie? Oh, not just a tool of the bourgeoisie, me from the past, but a card-carrying member of it. I mean, you have employees whose labor you can exploit because you own the means of production, which in your case includes a chalkboard, a video camera, a desk, and a xenophobic globe. Meanwhile, Stan, Danica, Raul, and Meredith toil in crushing poverty. Stan, did you write this part? These are all lies. Cue the intro. So last week we saw how commercial farming transformed the American West and gave us mythical cowboys and unfortunately not so mythical Indian reservations. Today we leave the sticks and head for the cities, as so many Americans and immigrants have done throughout this nation's history. I mean, we may like to imagine that the history of America is all go west, young man, but in fact, from Mark Twain to pretty much every hipster in Brooklyn, it's the opposite. So population was growing everywhere in America after 1850. Following a major economic downturn in the 1890s, farm prices made a comeback and that drew more and more people out west to take part in what would eventually be called agriculture's golden age. Although to be fair, agriculture's real golden age was in like 3000 BCE when Mesopotamians were like, dude, if we planted these in rows, we could have more of it than we could eat. So it was really more of a second golden age. But anyway, more than a million land claims were filed under the Homestead Act in the 1890s. And between 1900 and 1910, the populations of Texas and Oklahoma together increased by almost two million people. And another 800,000 people moved into Kansas, the Dakotas, and Nebraska. That's right, people moved to Nebraska. Sorry, I just hadn't yet offended Nebraskans. I'm looking to get through the list before the end of the year. But one of the central reasons that so many people moved out west was that the demand for agricultural products was increasing due to the growth of cities. In 1880, 20% of the American population lived in cities, and there were 12 cities with a population over 100,000 people. This rose to 18 cities in 1900, with the percentage of urban dwellers rising to 38%. And by 1920, 68% of Americans lived in cities, and 26 cities had a population over 100,000. So in the 40 years around the turn of the 20th century, America became the world's largest industrial power and went from being predominantly rural to largely urban. This is, to use a technical historian term, a really big deal. Because it didn't just make cities possible, but also their products. It's no coincidence that while all this was happening, we were getting cool stuff like electric lights and moving picture cameras, neither of which were invented by Thomas Edison. I don't know if you've noticed, but suddenly there are a lot more photographs in Crash Course U.S. History B-roll. So the city leading the way in this urban growth was New York, especially after Manhattan was consolidated with Brooklyn and the Bronx, Queens, and Staten Island in 1898. At the turn of the century, the population of the 23 square miles of Manhattan Island was over two 
million. And the combined five boroughs had a population over four million. But while New York gets most of the attention in this time period, and all time periods since, it wasn't alone in experiencing massive growth. Like my old hometown of Chicago, after basically burning to the ground in 1871, became the second largest city in America by the 1890s. Also, they reversed the flow of the freaking Chicago River, probably the second most impressive feat in Chicago at the time. The first being that the Cubs won two World Series. Even though I'm sorely tempted to chalk up the growth of these metropolises to a combination of better nutrition and a rise in scootily pooping, I'm gonna have to bow to stupid historical accuracy and tell you that much of the growth had to do with the phenomenon that this period is most known for immigration. Of course, by the end of the 19th century, immigration was not a new phenomenon in the United States. After the first wave of colonization by English people and Spanish people and other Europeans, there was a new wave of Scandinavians, French people, and especially the Irish. Most of you probably know about the potato famine of the 1840s that led a million Irish men and women to flee. If you don't know about it, it was awful. And the second largest wave of immigrants was made up of German speakers, including a number of liberals who left after the abortive revolutions of 1848. All right. Let's go to the thought bubble. The Irish had primarily been farmers in the motherland, but in America, they tended to stay in cities like New York and Boston. Most of the men began their working lives as low-wage, unskilled laborers, but over time, they came to have much more varied job opportunities. Irish immigrant women worked too, some in factories or as domestic servants in the homes of the growing upper class. Many women actually preferred the freedom that factory labor provided, and one Irish factory woman compared her life to that of a servant by saying, our day is 10 hours long, but when it's done, it's done, and we can do what we like with the evenings. That's what I've heard from every nice girl that's tried service. You're never sure that your soul is your own, except when you're out of the house. Most German speakers had been farmers in their home countries and would remain farmers in the U.S., but a number of skilled artisans also came. They tended to stay in cities and make a go of entrepreneurship. Bismarck himself saw emigration from Germany as a good thing, saying, the better it goes for us, the higher the volume of emigration. And that's why we named a city in North Dakota after him. Although enough German German immigrants came to New York that the Lower East Side of Manhattan came to be known for a time as Kleindeutschland, Little Germany. Many moved to the growing cities of the Midwest, like Cincinnati and St. Louis. Some of the most famous German immigrants became brewers, and America is much richer for the arrival of men like Frederick Pabst, Joseph Schlitz, and Adolphus Busch. And by richer, I mean drunker. Hey, thanks for not ending on a downer, Thought Bubble. I mean, unless you count alcoholism. So, but by the 1890s, over half of the 3.5 million immigrants who came to our shores came from Southern and Eastern Europe, in particular Italy and the Russian and Austro-Hungarian empires. They were more likely than previous immigrants to be Jewish or Catholic, and while almost all of them were looking for work, many were also escaping political or religious persecution. And by the 1890s, they also had to face new scientific theories, which I'm putting in air quotes to be clear, because there was nothing scientific scientific about them, which consigned them to different races whose low level of civilization was fit only for certain kinds of work and predisposed them to criminality. The Immigration Restriction League was founded in Boston in 1894 and lobbied for national legislation that would limit the number of immigrants, and one such law even passed Congress in 1897 only to be vetoed by President Grover Cleveland. Good work, Grover. You know, his first name was Stephen, but he called himself Grover. I, I would have made a different choice. But before you get too excited about about Grover Cleveland, Congress and the President were able to agree on one group of immigrants to discriminate against, the Chinese. Chinese immigrants, overwhelmingly male, had been coming to the United States, mostly to the West, since the 1850s to work in mines and on the railroads. They were viewed with suspicion because they looked different, spoke a different language, and they had strange habits, like regular bathing. By the time the Chinese Exclusion Act went into effect in 1882, there were 105,000 people of Chinese descent living in the United States, mainly in cities on the West Coast. San Francisco refused to educate Asians until the state Supreme Court ordered them to do so, and even then the city responded by setting up segregated schools. The immigrants fought back through the courts. In 1886, in the case of Yik Wo versus Hopkins, the United States Supreme Court ordered San Francisco to grant Chinese-operated laundries licenses to operate. Then in 1898, in United States versus Wong Kim Ark, the court ruled that American-born children of Chinese immigrants were entitled to citizenship under the 14th Amendment, which should have been a duh, but wasn't. We've been hard on the Supreme Court here at Crash Course, but those were two good decisions.
You go, Supreme Court. But despite these victories, Asian immigrants continued to face discrimination in the form of vigilante-led riots like the one in Rock Springs, Wyoming that killed 26 people and congressionally approved restrictions, many of which the Supreme Court did uphold. So, yeah. Also, it's important to remember that this large-scale immigration and the fear of it was part of a global phenomenon. At its peak between 1901 and the outbreak of World War I in 1914, 13 million immigrants came to the United States in the entire period touched off by the industrialization from 1840 until 1914, a total of 40 million people came to the U.S. But at least 20 million people emigrated to other parts of the Western Hemisphere, including Brazil, the Caribbean, Canada, yes, Canada, and Argentina. As much as we have Italian immigrants to thank for things like pizza, and we do thank you, Argentina can be just as grateful for the immigrant ancestors of Leo Messi. Also the Pope, although he has never once won La Liga. And there was also extensive immigration from India to other parts of the British Empire, like South Africa, Chinese immigration to South America, America and the Caribbean. I mean, the list goes on and on. In short, America is not as special as it fancies itself. Oh, it's time for the mystery document? The rules here are simple. I guess the author of the mystery document, I get it wrong, and then I get shocked with the shock pen. Sorry, I don't mean to sound defeatist, but I don't have a good feeling about this. All right. The figure that challenged attention to the group was the tall, straight father, with his earnest face and fine forehead, nervous hands, eloquent in gesture, and a voice full of feeling. This foreigner, who brought his children to school as if it were an act of consecration, who regarded the teacher of the primer class with reverence, who spoke of visions like a man inspired in a common classroom. I think Miss Nixon guessed what my father's best English could not convey. I think she divined that by the simple act of delivering our school certificates to her, he took possession of America. Uh, I don't know. At first I thought it might be someone who works with immigrants, like Jane Addams, but then at the end, suddenly it's her own father. Jane Addams' father was not an immigrant. Mary Anton, does she even have a Wikipedia page? She does? Did you write it? Stan, Stan wrote her Wikipedia page. Ah! So this document, while it was written by someone who should not have a Wikipedia page, points out that most immigrants to America were coming for the most obvious reason, opportunity. Industrialization, both in manufacturing and agriculture, meant that there were jobs in America. There was so much work, in fact, that companies used labor recruiters who went to Europe to advertise opportunities. Plus, the passage was relatively cheap, provided you were only gonna make it once in your life, and it was fast, taking only eight to 12 days on the new steam-powered ships. The the East Side of Manhattan became the magnet for waves of immigrants, first Germans, then Eastern European Jews and Italians who tended to recreate towns and neighborhoods within blocks and sometimes single buildings. Tenements, these four, five, and six-story buildings that were designed to be apartments, sprang up in the second half of the 19th century, and the earliest ones were so unsanitary and crowded that the city passed laws requiring a minimum of light and ventilation. And often these tenement apartments doubled as workspaces because many immigrant women and children took in piecework, especially in the garment industry. Despite local laws mandating the occasional window and outlawing the presence of cows on public streets, conditions in these cities were pretty bad. Things got a little bit better with the construction of elevated railroads and later subways that helped relieve traffic congestion, but they created a new problem. Pickpockets. Pickpockets take advantage of the confusion to ply their vocation. The foul, close, heated air is poisonous. A healthy person cannot ride a dozen blocks without a headache. So that's changed. This new transportation technology also enabled a greater degree of residential segregation in cities. Manhattan's downtown area had at one time housed the very rich as well as the very poor, but improved transportation meant that people no longer had to live and work in the same place. The wealthiest, like Cornelius Vanderbilt and J.P. Morgan, constructed lavish palaces for themselves and uptown townhouses were common. But until then, one of the most notable features of Gilded Age cities like New York was that the rich and the poor lived in such close proximity to each other. And this meant that with America's growing urbanization, the growing distance between rich and poor was visible to both rich and poor. And much as we see in today's megacity, this inability to look away from poverty and economic inequality became a source of concern. Now, one way to alleviate such concern is to create suburbs so you don't have to look at poor people. But another response to urban problems was politics, which in cities like New York became something of a contact sport. Another response was the so-called progressive movement. And in all these responses and in the issues that prompted them, urbanization, mechanization, capitalism, the distribution of resources throughout the social order, we can see modern industrial America taking shape. And that is the America we live in today. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next week. Okay, so down here it also talks about how nativists opposed immigration.
fearing that immigrants might threaten the country's mostly English culture. Um, you see this as a theme <laughs> over time, basically all sorts of immigrant groups. And we'll, we'll revisit this point again when we talk about um, drugs and alcohol, like the criminalization of a lot of drugs. It's really associated often with immigrant groups that are then targeted by law enforcement. So, um, <clears throat> you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later as well. But when it comes to this kind of nativist argument, it's really interesting how much this has persist persisted over time, considering all of these people have migrated to this country in some way or another, right? The only people that are actually nativists are Native Americans. <laughs> of course, they're not nativists. They're not trying to tell everyone to leave, right, and go back to where they came from, but they're really the only ones that have rights to do so. So it's interesting that this nativist argument is something you can see, you know, in the time period of the potato famine when we have this huge wave of immigration from, you know, Ireland and all these people that are coming here destitute and starving. And the sentiment at the time was, you know, these people, they're terrible. Look at how many children they're having, their weird language, their weird culture, their weird food. You know, um, a lot of them were you know, well, basically at the same time German immigrants came here and were, you know, the liquor, like they said in the video, that kind of thing, you know, they were changing the cultural fabric of what was considered American. And so there was a large pushback to that, but you still see that mirrored today in our kind of current day, um, stigmatizing and scapegoating of immigrant groups is very similar, right? That these people don't learn the language. They have too many children. They're going to change what is, you know, what they were calling, of course, English culture here, is really what they mean is white culture, right? This kind of white supremacist notion that somehow we're diluting the whiteness of the culture, which again, super creepy, not real. Whiteness is, is a thing that we created. So <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, the whole thing's bizarre. But it's really interesting because it's important to understand why people think these things and how they think them because they really shape the actual lived experiences of a lot of people, you know, um, as a result. Some more recent immigration history. Um, in 1965, Congress ended the quota system, the very, very racist quota system that basically said that, you know, um, it gave preferential treatment to, of immigration from only specific countries, meaning that like white, um, you know, European countries that we favored, not Eastern European um, countries had the most, uh, had the most favor as far as, um, you know, you could only have so many people coming from Africa. You could only have so many people coming from Latin America. This idea of a quota, right? Um, once that was taken away by uh, President Johnson, said, you know, that it was racist, basically, that it was racist by its design. What's actually fascinating is this whole right now, going on right now, uh, executive order thing with the travel ban for people from these specifically, quote unquote, predominantly Muslim countries. Um, what's interesting is it goes in direct opposition to this 1965 um, presidential order that Lyndon Johnson put in to that was a response to this then of course Congress um, did end it in response so anyway kind of fascinating like this history as much as it seems like old and 1965 to people that were born in the 90s or 2000s it's probably like 10,000 years ago to you but when you think about how this is actually super relevant to the current immigration interest stuff going on right now that will definitely be considered history soon. Um, yeah, interesting. Anyway, so after they changed the quota system and allowed people to come in from countries all over the world, um, there was another wave of immigrants, mostly from Mexico and other Latin American nations, and uh, the Philippines, South Korea, and other Asian countries. So again, before that, um, you know, there were a lot of different restrictions from certain countries saying, you know, people from those areas couldn't come here. And, um, you know, going all the way back to, you know, the kind of Chinese exclusion acts or, you know, when we, um, and again, we, the proverbial we, meaning America, it wasn't specifically us, but whatever. Um, when the West was being built, you know, where we basically live now, um, and the gold rush times and when they were building the railroads, there were a lot of um, Chinese men used as labor for the railroads. But, um, you know, they were also considered you know, an immigrant threat, uh, something different from normal um, or from what was considered the kind of white norm. So they were demonized. The drugs that they used were demonized. Um, and there was, they put in this act basically called the Chinese Exclusion Act saying that you couldn't have anyone else migrating from China to the U.S. Um, 
which made it so that these men who had come out here to work and were, you know, trying to basically bring their wives and their families over here were effectively cut off from doing so. So anyway, you know, we have a long history of these kind of things, so um, it's kind of not as surprising of what's happening today. Um, also in 1986, there was the Immigrant Control and Reform Act, which outlawed the hiring of undocumented immigrants. And um, also, again, remember, Ronald Reagan, um, he, during this, this um, Reform Act, also granted amnesty to um, people that were undocumented that were already in the U.S. in 1986. So kind of similar to the DACA situation or Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals of what Obama signed into law, you know, what, what basically known as the Dreamers, um, people who were brought here as children, um, you know, illegally that, um, you know, fit certain qualifications, are given work visas, are able to go to school, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and now, right now, a lot of people are wondering what's going to happen with that as there's about 750,000 people that are under that, on that list, whether or not they're going to get to have their status renewed. Actually, there's the first DACA case ever to be, um, imprisoned right now and potentially may be deported is happening right now. Um, so anyway, really current stuff as much as we're talking about history. Okay. So again, current, um, in 2012, uh, 41 million people in the U.S., about 13%, um, were foreign-born, according to the census info. Um, and when it comes to people that are undocumented, um, there was a peak of 12.2 million in 2007. Again, these are estimates. Um, down to about 11 million in t 2009. Um, and of course, because think about it, from 2007 to 2009, uh, economy not so great, right? But as the economy gets better, they assume that people will start coming back more. Um, also, this idea of a one-way border um, is really flawed. Demographers or people that study, um, you know, how people uh, migrate, you know, and uh, all those kind of population statistics, um, they find that there's actually a very interesting cyclical uh, migration situation between the U.S. and Mexico border. So a lot of people may come here to work for some of their adult lives, but then they often go and retire back into Mexico. So there is a cyclical migration, more so than people think it's a one-way situation. Anyway, nuance no one asked. Okay. Um, okay, so when it comes to, you know, when I keep saying minorities, people that are, you know, marginalized, what does that even mean, right? That's just people that are identified by physical or cultural traits that subject that means that they are subjected to disadvantages right so characteristically meaning you share a distinctive identity and you experience social disadvantage so you know for the example poverty all people that you know um, live under the poverty line are going to experience kind of similar social disadvantages when it comes to being able to afford to live right for example so it's the same kind of thing when it comes to uh, racial and ethnic groups about 37% of people in the U.S. fall into a minority racial or ethnic category. So there's a lot of people that are, you know, um, kind of at risk of, of being subjected to di these disadvantages. All right. Um, so some of the pattern of minority-majority interactions, um, none of them great. Uh, the first is genocide. So this is the systematic killing of one category of people by another. Um, kind of the most extreme. Most people think of, you know... Um, Nazi Germany and the Holocaust when I think of genocide, but of course we can always look at our own history um, and find plenty of genocide, especially when it comes to the native peoples and what was done um, to them by, you know, early colonizing settlers. Um, segregation, which is the physical and social separation of categories of people, again, something we can see in our own um, history, uh, Jim Crow segregation laws, um, or even really the black codes and the Jim Crow segregation that followed after, after the Reconstruction era of after slavery. Um, you know, this is something that really had affected uh, generations of people, whether or not they had opportunities and even structurally separated people, meaning that you had different standard of education, different center of housing, different standard of everything, um, you know, which of course causes a lot of disadvantages for some groups and a lot of privilege for others. Um, assimilation is the process by which minorities gradually adopt the cultural patterns of the dominant majority, meaning that's kind of the assumption of immigration is that people come to the country, 
they learn the language and they assimilate, meaning that they become quote unquote American, that they just kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's actually the process that happens with second, third generation immigrants, right? Where your parents were immigrants or maybe your grandparents were immigrants, where you start to lose your language of origin. You start to believe in the culture and value system of the country you grew up in more so than what your parents did, right? Assimilation. Anyway, pluralism is kind of the opposite. It's a state when people of all racial and ethnic categories have roughly equal social standing, meaning instead of telling people they should all meet some specific white normative middle class standard to be an American, that instead we should just say, hey, to be an American means that, you know, it could mean a lot of things. It could mean different, you know, different cultural or ethnic heritages uh, in your past. It could mean uh, all sorts of different religions and practices and belief systems, um, because that's really what this country was all about, right? Was, you know, people were trying to escape religious persecution. So, um, you know, that's an example of pluralism. It's really just accepting um, all people for their differences and not really trying to force them to be a set standard. Okay, so when it comes to, um, you know, the social standing of Native Americans, obviously, this is a big part of going back to what I was just talking about with the genocide and segregation and all this horrible stuff. Um, you know, the population of natives dropped from millions before Europeans arrived to about 250,000 by 1900 um, because of the kind of extermination campaigns, uh, smallpox blankets, uh, trail of tears, marching people to their death, right? Um, forceful relocation, all that stuff. Forced assimilation also in the late 1800s, meaning um, people weren't allowed to speak their language um, or practice their customs. Um, you know, there's um, something we'll talk about when we talk about gender, uh, like the Bradachi or third spirit people, uh, people that are considered kind of like what we now would consider transgender or third gender um, within a lot of native cultures. Um, they were forced underground because that wasn't considered normative to the white European people that were coming in. So anyway, um, forced assimilation meant a lot of that kind of what they call cultural genocide, where you destroy the values, the language, the everything of a culture. So, um, you know, Native people didn't even gain full citizenship until the 20s. And since the 90s, there's been some improvement. Um, you know, Native American organizations have reported they have gains in membership apps, that children are starting to learn Native languages that were all, almost all but lost. And that some um, some tribes are were able to get casinos <clears throat> that could help profit, you know, themselves and the local community. But you know, the overwhelming majority do not, and uh, are still, you know, suffering economic disadvantages and social and cultural disadvantages. So, um, you know, for example, uh, most Am American Indians uh, remain severely disadvantaged with below average income a high rate of poverty, and a low rate of college graduation. Um, so when it comes to the standing of African Americans in the U.S., up until 1808, uh, slave traders brought 500,000 Africans to the U.S. as slaves. So half a million people, right, were, um, you know, stolen, um, captured, um, you know, put in chains, uh, forced upon these horrible ship voyages, and then, you know, sold at market um, and used as labor um, in really horribly exploitive, you know, deeply uh, exploitive ways, including um, what we'll talk about too when we talk a little bit about gender and those other issues later on, um, sexual assault of African-American women um, you know, by their slave masters, um, often the, the intentional division of families, um, just to, you know, hurt people or control them. Um, and so it really wasn't until the, um, you know, um, well in 1857, even the Dred, the Dred Scott case affirmed that slaves were not citizens entitled to rights. So even though, um, using the framework of our, of our culture that says, you know, all men are created equal, right? Well, they didn't really mean that when they said that, right? What did the framers mean? They meant white, you know, um, land-owning men. <laughs> I mean, everybody. So, you know, under that kind of 
con that concept of freedom, liberty, whatever, that's where a lot of people argued that, you know, um, that there needed to be emancipation. Like a, a lot of abolitionists kind of came from that perspective of if you say you're a democracy, you say you value freedom and liberty, how do you keep people in chains, right? So, you know, 1863, the Emancipation Proclamation came about um, and quickly followed the 13th and 14th Amendment. The 13th Amendment, which banned slavery, and then the 14th, which granted citizenship to everyone born in the U.S., right? Um, because, again, uh, before this, um, oftentimes African Americans were counted as uh, three-fifths of a person under slavery. Um, again, just kind of seen as something that was owned by people, but it was it was a way for southern states to have more weight to um, their elected representatives was by counting their slaves. So it's just... You know, it's important to talk about this history because as much as we think of it as ancient, it was very not long ago, right, that a lot of these things um, were taking place. And the cultural, social, language, psychological, all of it, ramifications are still being seen very dramatically to this day, right? So after the Civil War, we have these Jim Crow laws passed by the states. So First, there's these what they call the black codes, where they say, you know, these very frivolous infractions and you'll be sent to jail where um, they would use you as contract labor. So basically, you're an emancipated slave, but now you're being put right back onto a sharecropper's field. But this time, you're being denied water or any sort of break of any type ever. And they don't care if you die within the field because they're going to get a whole nother group of people that were locked up for no reason the next day, right? These things were like vagrancy laws, meaning you're walking down the street and they're like, well, you're a vagrant. Why are you just walking down the street? Or, you know, you could be imprisoned for looking a white woman in the eyes, right? Things like that. Just like these crazy minor infractions, but they were seen as a way to control people of color and keep them separate and away from the people that were considered dominant, the ruling class people, right? The whites. And so, you know, Jim Crow laws basically solidified into the institutions of the time that, you know, there should be separate accommodations for people that have a lower um, social class standing due to their race or due to their ethnicity or whatever it was, right? Um, you know, even before Brown versus Board, there was a very famous case here in Westminster, but it was, uh, you know, specifically about um, the kind of school systems and how there were separate schools for um, for different racial ethnic groups, but we often hear about how there were schools for African American children, but we often don't hear about how Latino children had their own schools, Asian children had their own schools. These is this very segregated system. So, um, you know, after the Civil War, there was this kind of fear of, that white people had that was, you know, you have to put in a new social order to control people to make sure that they still remain dominant. And that was the Jim Crow laws. So um, after World War II, the Great Migration brought thousands of people to the north um, and started what's called the Harlem Renaissance. So basically, you know, people um, were able to, um, you know, move to areas that were more, um, became kind of enclaves, I guess, for art and culture and music and politics and thought and intellectualism. And, you know, kind of started these movements and these things that grew out of it, like the NAACP and things like that. Um, and then, of course, 1954, like I started to mention before, Brown versus Board, very famous case um, that ruled that schools can't be segregated, that separate is not equal, that, um, you know, if you're using state funds, that children should all be getting an education and not just one group getting a good education, one group not getting one at all. So, um you know, very famous case. And of course, in the 60s, there was the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, which were very essential to kind of establishing rights and social standing for African Americans. So uh, that sounds nice. But the issue is with the Voting Rights Act um, is that that was recently gutted by the Supreme Court a couple of years ago. They basically said that, um, you know, with a conservative majority, that it was no longer necessary. Um, which is just couldn't be farther from the truth. As soon as the Voting Rights Act, certain provisions, again, again, the Voting Rights Act itself stands, but certain provisions of the Voting Rights Act, which said that 
if a state wanted to change voting laws, that they would have to be reviewed. If there were states on a list that were historically known to have discriminated against African Americans or tried to prevent African Americans or other people of color from voting, that their new laws would have to be reviewed. So these provisions struck that down. And now um, we have all these crazy voting ID laws that popped up all over the country and marginalized hundreds of thousands of people out of voting this last election. So something we will totally be talking about when we get to the politics section. But um, just, you know, have to mention that or um, really highly recommend, if you haven't seen it, to watch the film Selma, which really chronicles uh, Martin Luther King's attempt to have the Voting Rights Act uh, passed and really um, why it needed to be passed in the first place, right? Because after the Civil Rights Act said people couldn't be discriminated against, right? But And it literally said for voting, but the fact was it had no teeth. It wasn't enforced. And uh, there's this great scene in the film where, you know, um, one of the characters who is played by Oprah Winfrey goes to um, register to vote and they ask her the most ridiculous things, right? Or just such difficult criteria in order to get the license to vote, so um, to register to vote. So, you know, saying things like, okay, um, what's the preamble to the Constitution? So then she's like, okay, we the people in order to form a perfect union, blah, 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 like rattles off the whole thing. Um, and then it's like, okay, well, how many legislators, what are their names? How many judges are in this district? Okay, 70. Okay, what are the names of the judges? Like things that are so ridiculous that no like <laughs> right-minded voter would ever really know, um, especially offhand, were used as a way to legally justify discriminating against people of color. And a lot of people are arguing, and I'll show you a video later on, um, that this is being done again now that provisions of the Voting Rights Act have been struck down. We tend to think of discrimination as something way in the past, but I don't know. I think certain recent political events kind of have turned that on its head. Um, okay, when it comes to um, social standing of African Americans today, uh, people are still very disadvantaged, right? Um, as a group, African Americans have below average incomes. Um, so if you look at the median income for the entire U.S. population, about 62 grand versus African Americans average is 40 grand. So that's like a significant difference. Percentage living in poverty is quite a bit up from that as well. If you look at it, um, it's nearly double. Uh, the norm for the population, and percentage of people with uh, four more years of college, 25 and older, um, lower, about 10% lower than the average. So that's a problem, right? Poverty rate three times that of white poverty rate. Um, you know, lots of factory jobs have a lot to do with this. Um, you know, when we were talking about the Great Migration on the last slide, I was thinking about, again, something I mentioned the other day when we were talking about poverty, how... Um, you know, there's this guy, uh, Elijah Anderson, I use his book in another class I teach, and he talked about how when his dad moved as part of that great migration from the South, um, basically, um, with fourth grade education, he was able to make what would now be 55 grand a year, right? In a Studebaker factory, of course, working his ass off, but still, he was able to make that. When factory jobs left, nothing replaced them. There was just this economic void. Um, inner city economies um, were basically based on this uh, factory labor. And so um, with the deindustrialization, where all of these jobs went overseas so that corporations could make more money by paying people less, ignoring uh, environmental regulations so that they could pollute more, um, child safety laws, all that crap, right? Worker safety, um, all the things that people here had fought for. For a long time, um, they saw an economic advantage to sending jobs somewhere else. And through globalization, that gave us the opportunity for that to happen. We'll talk way more about this during globalization. But anyway, um, nothing came to replace it. Um, there weren't any like large infrastructure projects that happened within these areas that created alternative systems of economy that helped support people. Instead, generation after generation has become more and more entrenched in poverty in these inner city areas. Like Detroit is a great example. Once a booming city, right? Once a place, a, a very, you know, kind of metropolitan place has become, you know, kind of a shell of what it was because so many jobs left, so many people fell in on themselves economically, generationally, that, you know, it's really affected 
those communities dramatically. So anyway, um, yeah, we'll talk a lot more about the deindustrialization too. Okay. Um, when it comes to the social standing of Asian Americans, um, you know, Asian Americans are including people that have historical ties to dozens of different Asian nations. The largest number have roots in China, the Philippines, India, South Korea, and Japan. Um, and immigration from China and Japan began with the California gold rush, like I was talking about a little bit before, but, um, slowed, um, you know, once again, of course there was the, um, ban basically making it so people could not come to this country. Um, so, you know, once the economy slowed, um, after, you know, immigrants were used to help make the, the California gold rush possible, um, white people pressure legislators and courts to bar Asians from certain kinds of work. So they were really um, marginalized by, again, legal justifications of discrimination. There's a lot of those often built into the law. It's really sad. So, you know, um, here we have about how after, uh, during World War II, um, you know, for example, um, Roosevelt had an executive order that relocated hundreds of thousand or a hundred thousand uh, Japanese Americans to military camps. Um, again, something that seems somewhat relevant today. Um, George Takei, uh, who is, you know, famous for being in the original Star Trek or, you know, all that kind of stuff. He's pretty amazing. He's the guy that's like, Oh my. Anyway, um, he has some really interesting interviews and pieces that he's written about this because he actually, um, you know, spent a few years of his childhood inside of a Japanese internment camp. Um, his family was forcibly relocated to an internment camp when he was a child. And he talks about those years and it's really kind of chilling and just, wow. Um, you know, how basically because Pearl Harbor happened, um, even though these people were often American citizens, uh, they were suspect because of their race, because of their ethnicity, right? Um, something kind of akin to some of the stuff we see going on right now, right? So, um, you know, I, I really, really highly recommend if you're interested in that, you know, look into what he's written about it and his experiences in his childhood. It's really interesting. Um, so there was also, um, going back to what the book talks about, citizenship was granted to Chinese Americans in 1943 and to Japanese Americans in 1952. So it took a while after the war in order to kind of make that happen. Um, also, by the 80s, um, Asian Americans were called the model minority based on their cultural commitment to study and hard work, right? So the fact that um, Asian Americans actually have, um, you know, much higher incomes typically on the average. Again, there's certain certain groups within the pan-ethnic category Asian that are very marginalized, and there's other groups that have assimilated pretty successfully into American society, um, but yeah, this kind of label of the model minority, while it seems like a positive moniker, it also is a way to kind of diminish how many ways, um, Asian Americans are still being, um, you know, marginalized and discriminated against in our current society. So, um, going back to social standing, um, in 2012, um, the fastest increasing racial or ethnic category of U.S. population were um, Asian Americans, with most of the increase coming from immigration. So again, going back to the kind of when we we're talking about the money situation, uh, median family incomes, you can see that most groups of Asian Americans, it, when you do the pan-ethnic idea, it's 77 versus 62, tend to be doing better, um, you know, lower rates of poverty for the most part. Um, and percentage of those that have degrees, I mean, if you look at Asian Indian Americans, you got 72% versus 30% is the kind of overall U.S. pop, or 50% of, J of Japanese Americans, like that's a lot higher. So you can see how, um, you know, categories that have above average income and education tend to be related, right? If you have a higher education level, you have a higher income, hence why people go to college, right? So, um, but some poverty rates are really close to or even above the national average. So, you know, by averaging out everyone into one kind of big bubble, you tend to miss the groups that are being like really disadvantaged still. Okay, when it comes to the social standing of Hispanic Americans, um, this is the largest U.S. minority group, about 53 million people. And about 16.9% of the total population. Um, 
There's about 34 million people in that group that are of Mexican origin, 5 million Puerto Rican, 2 million Cuban. And again, there's no one la like specific Latino culture. Putting all people in a pan-ethnic box kind of, you know, kind of erases the edges of the difference, but there's still a lot of difference going on. So when it comes to social standing, um, overall standing is below U.S. average. So you can see the median family income. Um, 62 compared to about 40, 40, 41, 47. Um, percentage living in poverty is much higher, almost double for a lot of, uh, you know, specific groups. Um, and then percentage with four-year degree, I mean, if you look at Mexican-Americans, just under 10% versus 30%. So that's about 21 or 22% lower than the overall population. When you're looking at only 31%, that's enormous difference. So, um, you know, that makes a big difference in how, if you're going to live in poverty or what your median family income is, right? What your level of education is. So, um, Cuban Americans have had more, um, education and higher incomes tend to be more financially privileged. Um, so again, that link is there. Um, so you can see that with, if you look at Cuban Americans on the chart there, you got 24.3%, um, have four or more years of college right? Versus uh, every other kind of breakdown that they give you here, much higher. Uh, Mexican-Americans have the lowest relative ranking, right? They're kind of facing the most marginality and hardships there. Um, language barrier leads to limited job opportunities and higher dropout rates. I mean, obviously, if you're kind of being um, streamlined into classes uh, with people that aren't um, dual language speaking or are um, not, you know, um, basically the ESL uh, Engl English as a second language learners, um, you know, that's not going to kind of cause some of the deficits it could for those who are just kind of being streamlined and thrown into public education system without, you know, the same kind of language tools. Um, and so this represents about 10% of eligible voters are Hispanic Americans. So they're an important voting group um, when they turn out to the polls. Um, when it comes to the social standing of Arab Americans, um, immigration from many nations has created a culturally diverse Arab American population. So meaning culturally diverse, I mean, religion wise, um, some are Muslims, some are Christians, some are of other faiths, some speak Arabic, some don't, some speak Farsi, you know, there's all sorts of other different languages. Um, not all Arab Americans choose to maintain the traditions of their homeland. So many have lived in the U.S. for decades or even generations. Um, and, you know, Arab Americans represent about 1% of the U.S. population, and the majority of which are from Lebanon, Egypt, and Syria. When it comes to the social standing of Arab Americans, um, they're at, they have a, about an average income, but they have a higher poverty rate. You can see that there, about 23 compared to 15. Um, and when it comes to having education, very highly educated, about 50% almost, which is great. And then um, obviously since 2001, uh, the social standing of Arab Americans have been affected by what we now call Islamophobia, right? This is really a sad thing that there's a lot of um, people that are targeted that are Arab Americans um, as victims of hate crimes. Um, many feel they're subjected to ethnic profiling that threatens their civil liberties. Um, and so since the 2001, you know, um, a lot of people feel very marginalized culturally. Um, you know, like, like I know that there's people, especially with the immigration ban and all these things that are going on right now, there's women that feel uncomfortable wearing a hijab, for example, because they're afraid they're going to be harassed because of the visible marker of their religious faith. Um, that's a problem, right? You want people to actually be able to practice what they what they believe in right I mean that's kind of the whole point of religious freedom so it's it's really a scary situation for them right now okay so when it comes to understanding how we socially understand these categories of people prejudice is the first one so that's really any rigid or unfounded generalization about a category of people and a stereotype is very similar a stereotype is an exaggerated description applied to every person in some category Right? So to say you have one person did something to you and therefore every single person of that group to an exaggerated extent is therefore liable. Right? Um, racism, 
is the assertion that people are of one race are less worthy or even biologically inferior to those of others, right? This is the most serious example of prejudice. Um, and, you know, racism is something that it has a deep historical, scientific, religious, cultural bias. It's built into a lot of our cultural institutions. So it's very difficult to battle. It's what they call institutionalized racism, which we'll get to in a second. So continuing with prejudice, um, institutional racism is when racism is at work within the operation of social institutions. So meaning um, when an institution itself has a racist philosophy that governs it. So a lot of people argue that there's institutionalized racism within the criminal justice system, right? Which can be seen by a lot of statistics that show that, you know, people of color, and again, we'll talk about this when we talk about crime and <clears throat> delinquency and all that fun stuff. But, um, you know, people of color are much more likely to be imprisoned, um, to even encounter the criminal justice system than white people. Um, they're more likely to be imprisoned and they're more likely to get longer sentences. So, you know, when you look at these things from a statistical point of view, you know, out kind of the larger scale scope, you can start to see that there's these differences. And of course, these break down along all social locations, like for example, age plays a role in who encounters the criminal justice system, gender, right, plays a role in who's considered culpable and all that fun stuff. So race, of course, because we all have prejudices, whether we're sitting on a jury, whether we're a lawyer, whether we're the judge, him or herself, right? <laughs> whether we're the, the, the person that's that gets convicted of a crime, right? We all have biases that we learn from the culture about who's at fault, who's considered more dangerous than others. And we'll talk about a lot of this when we talk about deviance. But anyway, you know, when institutional racism involves an organization with a lot of power, bringing about change can be difficult. So for example, um, obviously our, our government has a lot of institutionalized racism in it. I mean, for the fact that, you know, the founders didn't include women or people of color or poor people, um, in the all people that were created equal situation. Um, <laughs> so they were not given the same rights. Um, you know, that shows that when you try and change an institution like the government or, you know, the criminal justice system or, you know, those kind of things, the military, that can be very difficult because they have a lot of power and organizations with a lot of power will typically use that power to keep relations the way that they are right now, or what they call the status quo. <clears throat> so two key factors that, that are part of this cause of prejudice are personality factors and societal factors. So, you know, obviously some people might have certain characteristics of their personalities that just make them kind of more of a jerk <laughs> or more suspicious of other people, right? But the societal factors are huge, right? Like the fact that we grow up in very segregated situations and very segregated lives means that most people, you know, there's more racial segregation now than when it was actually legal, um, you know, as far as how people are grouped in residential segregation. So it's really interesting how, you know, financial opportunities, how the structure and opportunities of society are reflected in what race of people live in your neighborhood. Um, so, you know, we are pretty separate still, and we tend to live separate lives and not kind of understand or encounter other people. And when we don't understand something, it's easy to believe mistruths or falsehoods about that, right? So it's easy to believe a stereotype when you don't know something. So for example, um, <clears throat> you know, for a lot of people that had stereotypical views about LGBTQ people, that's often because they don't have someone in their life that is LGBTQ. If they do, then they know that like, that's just another human person, <laughs> right? And that there's nothing strange or sinister or choice or any of that, um, or quote unquote, the gay agenda, right? Any of that kind of sinister, nefarious, anything, then they understand it's just a human rights thing. People are people. So when you're, aren't, when you're separated from people, that's important to understand because if you don't have, if that societal factor is residential segregation, we don't have access to each other. We don't understand each other. It's easier to point the finger and really not get to know each other. <clears throat> Multiculturalism um, refers to educational programs that are designed to recognize cultural diversity in the U.S. and promote respect for all cultural traditions. Um, 
technically this class is probably part of your multicultural requirement, <laughs> meaning at some point in college, you're going to have to sit through someone like me explaining to you that people are human people that you should care and about and respect, right? It's, it's not so bad. So anyway, um, <laughs> multiculturalism <clears throat> uh, claims that um, society has sought to minimize cultural diversity, right? So basically saying that our culture really wants people to assimilate. We're really weird about people having their own traditions or languages or practices. We want to minimize difference. We want everyone to be the same, right? And then, of course, that sameness isn't just any standard. It's not like we want everyone to speak Mandarin Chinese, right? We have a very Eurocentric bias, meaning, you know, European centralized bias in what we think everyone should be or how they should be or act or talk or <clears throat> how they should live, right? What their family should look like, what their values should be. It's a very Eurocentric bias. So, um, you know, liberals and conservatives differ over how much stress we should place on this single national identity. So for conservatives, they argue that we do. We need a strong kind of American identity, America, I'm sorry, um, to, to kind of coalesce our nationalism together as a country so we have a shared identity. But liberals stress that, you know, we, we really don't need to highlight the sameness, we should highlight differences between us and how that makes us stronger. That because there's many different kinds of us, there's many different ways that we kind of lend something to each other, that we are better together, that kind of idea. So, you know, even the, the kind of political understandings of this are very important in the modern day. <clears throat> so while, dis while uh, prejudice is an attitude, so you can be prejudiced, but not necessarily discriminate, meaning, you know, discrimination is the actual action. So, um, you know, that's kind of that difference. So discrimination involves the unequal treatment of various categories of people. And institutional discrimination, um, well, actually, going back for a second, discrimination can be positive or negative. So that's an interesting thing as well that we'll talk about. But um, <clears throat> institutional discrimination is built into the operation of social institutions, including the economy, schools, and the legal system. So meaning that there are certain groups that get preference and certain groups that get, you know, um, disadvantaged just because the system itself favors certain people. You know, and we'll, we can see this definitely in especially the legal system, schools, and economy. So affirmative action... Um, you know, kind of came about from this idea that prejudice and discrimination are going to reinforce each other. If someone has a belief that a group of people don't deserve something and they have the power and ability to deny that group of people rights, they're going to do it, right? Which means that they maintain their social inequality over time. So affirmative action policies were seeking to break the circle of prejudice and discrimination and make it so that people could have opportunities, that you couldn't just say like, okay, well, I'm not going to hire any people from these groups I don't like, right? So instead saying, no, you know, you have to hire people. You can't, you know, deny a job to someone on the basis of their race or ethnicity. <clears throat> Though people still do, it's illegal, right? But um, it wasn't always the case. So these affirmative action policies are really just trying to say, hey, if, if women and people of color have been systematically kept out of certain jobs and certain positions by people in power that didn't want them to work there, then we need to have these policies to give them opportunities that they're being denied because of prejudice, right? So this is something that <clears throat> also went on within, um, a lot of people think of it with jobs, but it was also something with college um, for people to get into schools. And we'll be talking about that a bit more too when we talk about um, the institutional stuff later. <clears throat> So U.S. courts have continued to refine and define aff affirmative action policies. So um, basically, there's been a lot of criticism of them, even though they were very successful at what they did, um, because people have a misnomer that somehow affirmative action is reverse racism or reverse prejudice or reverse whatever, if that even makes sense. You can't reverse a power dynamic. So that makes literally no sense. If they mean that it's preferencing them over another group. Yes, but that's not the same thing as reverse racism. That would be changing the entire societal structure as to the 
the value system, the language, the culture, the everything to devalue that group of people systematically for hundreds of years. Like that's not, it's not the same thing, like not even at all. But anyway, um, affirmative action policies, like people would have like Scalia, for example, that the Supreme Court dude that died <clears throat> like a while ago, but for some reason Republicans wouldn't let Obama replace him. Um, he had said something stupid about affirmative action, actually not that long before he died, about how, um, you know, it's not a good thing for colleges to have affirmative action policies or for, for states to have their colleges have affirmative action policies because then there's people of color getting into these colleges and then they're way out of their league and they don't know what to do, right? Which is super offensive and totally not true. Not based on anything statistical, just, you know, talking out his ass. And so... Um, what what was interesting about what he said, though, touched upon a lot of people's stereotypes about affirmative action, right? That you're giving someone an opportunity that they don't deserve because you're taking it away from someone who deserves it. So who's the person that deserves it? Like, racially. It's a white person, right? And so that's kind of like really what is the baseline of that assumption, <clears throat> that white people belong in college. They belong in good jobs. They belong in nice houses. They belong in those things. So... You know, if a person is a person of color that faces housing discrimination, you know, that can be invisible to someone that's white because they don't face it. But they don't realize that whilst, whilst a person of color is less likely to be able to, to rent an apartment, to buy a home um, than a white person, it's privileging the white person to be more likely to be able to get a place, to be more likely to get a job, to be more likely to get into college. <clears throat> so the affirmative action assumptions people have is that you just are like a person of color and because of that you get into to Harvard or something. It's like, no, you still have to have, you know, 4.0 straight A's, um, every kind of, you know, extracurricular and every kind of exemplary thing, just like anyone else applying. But the idea is affirmative action said they also had to actually look at your application and not just deny it. Like um, something we'll talk about later on when we're talking about um, discrimination in work, um, how Oftentimes when people submit applications for jobs, if their name sounds more ethnic, they won't get a job. So I'll show you a video later in the class about a man named um, Jose that dropped the letter S from his name. And, you know, he had sent out resumes for a while and he couldn't get any jobs. And then he sent out jobs or resumes with the name Joe instead of Jose, everything else exactly the same. And he got like a million job offers. The idea being that the racialized assumption of who Jose is versus Joe um, even if they have the same qualifications, it's a subtle racial inherent bias that people have that they don't necessarily consciously realize that they're doing. So this leads to a lot of uh, problems, that, which is what affirmative action was supposed to fix. But there's been so much of political um, kind of rhetoric against it from the right about how it's unfair against white people that that's really kind of taken center stage in our current political system. <clears throat> Okay, when it comes to, um, you know, who thinks what, basically, about what this matters and how this works, um, conservatives argue that culture and effort matter, so that people are responsible for their own social standing. They say, you know, if you're poor, it's because you just aren't working hard. It's not because you were born poor in an area with no opportunities. It's just because you choose to be poor, right? And so cultural differences set some parts of the population apart from others, right? And that... They argue um, in a very functional, functionalist uh, ideology that a free society must be an unequal society, that you have to have people that are very rich, that are privileged, because that motivates other people to work harder to get to a better position, right? <clears throat> That's their kind of like Ayn Rand-ish weirdness. Um, and when they argue that um, affirmative action reverse, uh, operates as reverse discrimination, <clears throat> and I'm going to show you a clip about that real quick right here. This video is part of a series for Everyday Feminism, a website dedicated to helping you stand up to and break down everyday oppression.
When I think of topics that I'd want to discuss with ultra conservative family members, affirmative action is probably at the bottom of my list, right next to police brutality and immigration reform. I'm sure we've all heard comments from people before saying things like, slavery ended a long time ago, so why are black people still reaping the benefits? Or affirmative action discriminates against white people. Isn't that reverse racist? Affirmative action is often accused of being a racist system, and this is based on the assumption that we lived in a post-racist society, meaning racism is no longer an issue in the United States. If racism is no longer a problem, then why do we need programs that only benefit racial minority groups? Doesn't that exclude hardworking white people from jobs, schools, and financial aid in lieu of less deserving people of color? Let's break down this troublesome myth. First, I want to give you guys a little history lesson about affirmative action, namely what we don't normally think about as affirmative action. The period directly following World War II was a period of huge economic growth for the United States, as well as an expansion of the middle class. Thanks to the GI Bill, which was a bill passed that gave a range of benefits to returning veterans, many U.S. citizens were afforded upward mobility for the first time. Recipients of the GI Bill received reduced cost mortgages, low interest loans so they could start their own businesses, free or reduced cost tuition and housing for universities and trade schools, as well as one year of unemployment compensation. Between 1944 and 1949, almost 9 million veterans received $4 billion in unemployment compensation, and by 1962, $50 billion in loans, which is a lot. Another large source of assistance provided to Americans post-World War II was the creation of the Federal Housing Administration, or the FHA. The goals of the FHA were to improve housing standards and conditions, finance homes at affordable rates, and increase the size of the housing market. Because of this government agency, homeownership increased between 1934 and 2001 from 40% to 70%. The GI Bill and the Federal Housing Administration are arguably some of the largest affirmative actions programs in the U.S., but they aren't perceived that way because they predominantly benefited white Americans. When programs and policies largely benefit white people, they generally aren't considered affirmative action. Much like the way financial aid and tax breaks received by middle and upper class people aren't perceived as welfare. Because of the FHA and the GI Bill, masses of white veterans were able to buy houses, start their own businesses, and gain access to higher education, which up until that point had been a luxury only afforded to a few upper class elites. The thing about the GI Bill and the FHA is that they were extremely racist institutions. When World War II ended, veterans of color experienced numerous obstacles in trying to receive the same benefits as white veterans. Black soldiers were dishonorably discharged at suspiciously high rates in comparison to white soldiers. This made them completely ineligible for any of the benefits of the GI Bill. The soldiers of color who weren't dishonorably discharged were largely excluded from job training programs for careers in high paying fields. Instead, black veterans were channeled into low paying, traditionally designated black jobs. On top of this, segregation was still in place, excluding black veterans from attending the best universities. And unfortunately, the few historically black colleges were ill-equipped, underfunded, and unable to enroll the 70,000 black veterans who returned from the war. The educational gap between white Americans and Americans of color increased greatly during this time period. The Federal Housing Administration was also unapologetically in favor of racial segregation and actively banned people of color from moving into white neighborhoods. If a person of color did happen to gain access to one of these neighborhoods, then the property value of the entire neighborhood went down. In a process called redlining, neighborhoods with high population populations of people of color were denied loans and considered high-risk investments. During this time period, only about 2% of federally insured home loans were given to African Americans. Because of the decreased property values of communities of color, these neighborhoods were less likely to receive funds in public services and often fell into decay. The problem with discussing affirmative action as if racism is a problem of the distant past is that we ignore the very real effects that racist systems still have on people of color. So when I hear people bemoaning the injustice of affirmative action against white people, they fail to account for the very long history of racism that has elevated white Americans and given many of them the benefits that they receive today. Affirmative action helped millions of white families gain access to higher education, receive high paying jobs, and buy homes for the first time ever. We can't ignore the fact that entire racial groups were denied the same privilege. In 2015, we still see a large gap between the distribution of wealth between white homes and homes belonging to people of color. Residential segregation in neighborhoods exists as a direct 
direct result of these policies. Large gaps in education and wage earnings between white Americans and non-white Americans are still largely prevalent. When we connect the injustices that people of color experienced in the past with the injustices that still plague them today, it becomes more than just a mere coincidence. I think much of the time claims of affirmative action being discriminatory are used to invalidate the successes of people of color, but also an excuse to maintain the status quo. White people have had their place at the top for a very long time, and sometimes when we make room for minority groups, it can be perceived as something being taken away from them. With the creation of affirmative action programs, spaces in society that have historically been reserved for white Americans are meant to be made more inclusive of people of color, so that everyone can have an equal and fair chance. If you're part of a group that's benefited from discrimination in the past and you're used to receiving more than your fair share of opportunities, it can be easy to view affirmative action as something that's harmful to you. But it's important to remember that affirmative action is merely a response to the discrimination that already exists and has existed for centuries against people of color in the United States. Affirmative action is not meant to discriminate against white people. It's meant to reverse the discrimination that's denied people of color an equal place in society for hundreds of years. Okay, so when it comes to liberals, um, they argue that society and government matter. So they say societal factors are the main reasons for inequality. So prejudice, discrimination, institutional bias are the reasons that there's so much inequality, not because people are just um, different levels of good. Um, they argue that government action is what should be done, like the government should help people and provide services and you know opportunities for people. Um, and they argue that affirmative action is a policy that has worked, that has given people, um, you know, I mean, if you look at the difference before affirmative action policies to now, statistically, there's a strong argument for the fact that it's worked, meaning there's lots of research and, and data that demonstrates how women and people of color are much more represented in higher positions in companies as CEOs, as you know, industry leaders, and all sorts of professions that were very white male dominated previously. Um, you know, as a result of these affirmative action policies. So you know, worked is a subjective term, but there's a lot of data that supports that. <clears throat> and radicals argue that fundamental change is needed. So radicals suggest two ways to solve the problem of racial and ethnic inequality: attack the source of inequality which is capitalism itself. So capitalism wants us to be separate. It wants us to be, you know, groups kind of like Marx and Engels and those are talking about and they talked about in the book <clears throat> from a very conflict theory perspective um, that it's this separation of society that makes us consumers that, you know, really fuels a lot of the inequality. That if we favor a system where people are in a hierarchy and they have to fight for resources, you know, people are going to suffer from that system. Some people might succeed, but a lot of people will suffer. And so they argue that we should eliminate the concept of race completely because it provides an ideological basis for dividing people, right? We should actually look at people based on their merits and not based on their skin tone or essentialize or think things about them or, you know, their group based on, you know, the melan melan melanin that they're displaying in their skin, right? Right. <laughs>